Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Well, I do it all because uh, I'm originally from Alabama, and the way we grew up was we either hunted it or grew it, or we didn't eat. And I thought everybody was like that. So for Phil to Grill, I always say all of this stuff that I'm teaching or I'm introducing other people, it's literally what I learned from my grandparents. Uh, well, after the military, I became a child and family therapist. And so I did that for a while. Um, that got me into mainstream entertainment, and, and that's how I ended up in Hollywood. And so I've done a lot of that kind of thing, thing, and I've always helped. I love helping people that are trying to help themselves. And that was me giving back. I found, I was looking for a way and I, and I found it. I was like, all of this makes sense. It's, it's like, I just have to film what I'm doing. And bringing the veterans and law enforcement, it helps being out in the wilderness. It helps going out fishing on a lake. Sometimes you're talking, sometimes you're not. All of the downtime. And I've, ha I've had so many just blessed moments where people's lives have been changed just from being out one time. Hi, I'm Christy Titus, and there has never been a more important time in our lives to take protecting our health, our home, and our family more seriously. The firearm that I most often carry concealed is the Ruger LCP-2. It is rated best in class for a lightweight compact pistol, and rightfully so. The LCP-2 is chambered in 380, which is a great choice for personal protection. The big bonus is the new Ruger light rack slide where the name says it all. The light racking allows for more people to confidently operate and shoot this pistol. All of this adds up to the LCP2 pistol being extremely easy to operate. So if you want to learn more about the LCP2, head over to Ruger.com or visit your local retailer to shop. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. I'm here with my good friend Rydell Danzi of Field to Grill. And you have been you've been doing Field to Grill for I'm trying to think when we met. We met through Carly Twizzleman. She was doing NRA TV. No, no. I introduced you to Carly Twistleman because she wanted to see you and that was during oh, Cowboy is that right? Christmas. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so okay. we knew each other at least two years before that. And then, uh, yeah, because I was with her and Levi. Yeah. And she goes, you know, and I was like, yeah. So I hit you up, and then we all yeah. came well, together. Well, now she's like one of my favorite humans. Oh, we love you, Carly. <laughs> Carly, 100%. She already knows. She reminds me of my grandmother. Oh, whoa. And I told her, if, like, if, I had, <laughs> if I had kids, I would have no issues with just letting her keep yeah. them. Like yeah. none. She's she's top-notch person. Oh, she's awesome. So yeah. she was doing, you know, hosting a bunch of TV for mm -hmm. NRA, and she was at Hunter Outdoor Christmas, and needed to meet some people and I happen to know a few people because yeah. I don't stop talking ever and so <laughs> right I'll instantly thought of me like oh you should meet Christy because she she doesn't shut up and meets a lot of people so <laughs> here we go and this hence the podcast well you two are like perfect you you know you're really good human beings you have you have great open hearts you're not just looking for something like what can you do for me what can you do for me well, like you I appreciate you always like off, off clear me. misconceptions about me <laughs> <laughs> really good human being I don't know where I got that but thank Thank you. <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. No. She's fantastic, and uh, she's a great two-way advocate and yes, doing is. a lot of really yes, good things for uh, for the industry as a whole, and as are you. So how many years have you done Field to Grill? I'm trying to like place I, this back. I actually had the conception back in 2016 at SHOT Show Yeah. when I shot for the Barbie baby people gun shooting something i was with what, the I was barbie with, baby was barbie people. babies i don't know what they're called now but i was with amy robinson Beanie babies? it was something like that <laughs> we, we took a, a lot of two-way women took them out okay. in the desert and okay. shot and i was talking with amy robinson and i was like hey what do you think about this and i said fill the grill i know i said something to something and she goes no just make it fill to grill and i was like you know what you're right you're right and then i went and did some stuff and then boom it was basically the things that i was already doing anyway yeah just took and off. i just threw a name on it and yeah. so yeah 
That's awesome. Well, and so you're, so the whole premise, obviously, Field of Girls, pretty self-explanatory. Um, <laughs> for those of you <laughs> out there that can't put that together, he goes hunting and then cooks it. And exactly. um, so I really, I'm so jealous that you have a cooking show because I really like eating. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I need to do more cooking in my life. But, um, you know, tell everybody a little bit about what, you, you know, wor- mm. what you're doing with that. Like you're bird hunting, you're deer hunting, you're doing it all. Well, I do it all because uh, I'm originally from Alabama, and the way we grew up was we either hunted it or grew it, or we didn't eat. And I thought everybody was like that. So so you are like an original homesteader. Yes, ma'am. Well, not original, because we've had our land since the 1700s. Well, that's pretty darn original. I mean, like we're like 1776. Where are we going here? uh. (laughs) But that's really so. Your family farm. I didn't realize your family farm has been. Yeah. Since the 1700s. Since the 1700s. That is That's incredible That's how far back our, um, our uh, burial grounds grow. My grandma, she was the last one to know like, where everybody is because a lot of it's overgrown now. Wow. And the way that they did it, like, it goes back into nature. Yeah. And so when I was on leave, I came back from overseas, and I took her out, and I had her like write down. Every, well, I wrote it down. She told me where everything yeah. was at. And so, like, my dad is the next one in line. Actually, my great uncle Harold, he's the next one in line. He's, like, right at 100 right now. And He's alive? It, yeah, well, yeah, for the next couple of days. Aww. But it's all, no, it's all good. We always. Uncle Harold, we love you. <laughs> we have always uh, celebrated death because everybody has uh, gotten to be ripe in old age and no complications. Yeah. And then it's like spry up into the last two weeks and it's mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm ready to check out. Yeah. So, yeah, the only one was uh, my baby brother. He's the only one that's uh, passed on at a different age. Young. So, mm-hmm. that yeah. was a big shot. So, yeah. Yeah. Well. Thank you guys for your service and obviously your tremendous sacrifice and um, so much. You've done so much, not only for our country, but for hunting and and for kind of preserving a way of life that yeah. really feels like it's slipping, sadly slipping through our hands, you know? it, it I, You know, I think it's just been this disconnect. There's been this push over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And even being in Hollywood, people ask me, why don't you just go to the grocery store? Mm-hmm. Why don't you just go and do this? Why don't you just go and do that? And then when I explain to them, you know, you can kill an elk and like yeah. two people can eat off of that for a year. Two people try a family of four. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like that's a lot of meat. You're it talking is. hundreds of pounds of meat. Hundreds of pounds of meat. Yeah. But when you go and buy like a one pound ground beef mm-hmm. at the grocery store, that's like a hundred different animals all rolled up into one. You don't know how they were treated. You don't know mm. anything. And so that that footprint of if your thing is about killing. Yeah. It's so much more so than killing one elk a year, one deer a year, or three deer, depending on what part of the country you're in. So Yeah. So let's, you know, going back to your family's farm, what do you, are you raising, like, chickens on this or garden? You know, you talk about being and in, in growing up as kind of a... Mm-hmm original homesteader because this is a huge movement right now i think a lot of us can appreciate it's going back to that i mean yeah. i know so many people that are like man i just want an acre because i want to have some chickens mm-hmm. and I, I read a thing the other day that said if every person in america had two chickens the egg industry would collapse 100 like, percent. and chickens are easy to have well they eat everything they're little vultures it, um composting your scraps instead of just throwing it into your into your yeah. trash can they'll eat that they'll take care of your insects yeah. they help with your garden it's, it's a circle yeah. The, so are you doing that and a garden? And I am not now. I was. I had my chickens while I was out here, yeah. and I was actually trading those eggs for goat milk, and doing like that whole kind of deal. But so then, like a like what you call would be like a barter. Uh, yeah, but like a community swap. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's different Facebook groups. You can find people that are out there. They're like, you know, I have goat's milk. I have eggs. I have sheep's milk. I have mm-hmm. cow milk. I have whatever. And then everybody just kind of trades within each other and keep it in your own community. And it doesn't cost anything except for your own time. Mm-hmm. And everything just works out. That's really awesome. I I dig that concept because I have, um, You do you know Narissa from Girls With Guns? She has, I have to. Yeah, I feel like you've met her. Because that name sounds familiar, and but, I know girls with guns. Yeah, she has a lot of um, autoimmune issues, uh, uh-huh. and so she has cleaned up her diet and, like, pretty much exclusively shops locally. Mm-hmm. And, like, this is becoming such a thing. Like, Yogi and I were in Europe, and in Germany, they have all of these big, 
like plots of land laid out. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird because there's all these little mini gardens on them. And I'm like, what is going on? And it's where the city, like specifically where we were in Mm -hmm. Hamburg, they rent out these tiny tracts of land to people in an urban environment Mm -hmm. so they can actually put their hands in the soil and experiencing growing a garden and being a part of nature and and actually self-cultivating. And they could put like little sheds, Mm -hmm. you know, garden sheds on their little tracks that they lease. You can't live in them. I mean, you know, nothing like that. But, um, you know, have little garden sheds and just really kind of there's this huge emphasis on getting people in an urban environment to like reconnect and get back to to the earth and kind of recenter and um man i you know we had a garden at our last house and we're uh-huh. kind of in between so we don't have a garden right well, now there's a lot of places uh, like big cities where you will find those urban gardens you yeah. just have to look for it there's not it's not advertised anywhere they even have them here in vegas they have several of them and a lot of it is you know they take the kids out of junior high and they mm-hmm. teach them how to do all of that stuff and yeah then they trade with the other ones and they even come and do farmers markets and things of that nature, and they make money for themselves, make money for the schools, and uh, and for programs. Oh yeah, it, yeah. And you give if you give somebody a reason, or make them feel like they're wanted, mm. then all of the other stuff goes away. Yeah, I'm all into of that. the other things that you're thinking about, like oh well, they they're not able to do this, they're not able to do that, not at Robin stores. Yeah. 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 Well, or they just don't have any connection to anything, and especially a lot of kids. Um, sadly, don't have parents that they're even connecting with, and so mm-hmm. they seek they seek that connection in negative places, and 100%. and so they get sucked into things like gangs and drugs, and yeah. they get pulled away from the land and in in community, and and so that's that's a sad that's a sad thing that we have in a lot of communities that mm-hmm. you know we can all individually kind of try to help and yeah. work on and improve. Well, well, they go to the gangs and the negative side of things because that's where they're getting the attention and exactly. that's where they're connecting. Yeah. If they connect to something that is positive, especially if it's family, yeah. then your whole entire family is going to grow. And then when you have your kids and you can go see grandma, you can go yeah. see grandpa, and it's a whole different story. And being in the South, that's what it was. Yeah. We didn't have any money. I didn't know I didn't have any money until we moved into the city. Well, we called it the city. You would still call it the country. But, Wait, how um, many people are we talking? Uh, I graduated with like 300 and some change. Mm-hmm. So it's that. Like I had Small. Yeah. yeah. Same teachers my daddy had. No yeah. way. Come home, teachers are sitting there for lunch or <laughs> short dinner at least. So it's like that kind of thing. You can whip other people's kids. Yeah. 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 All of the families yeah. know each other. Yeah. Yeah. I was That's actually, I was just in Austin, Texas, and uh, I went to the Hogbook guy's place. Yeah. And I stopped at one of my American, or one of the American legions, and a guy was there from my hometown mm. out in the little part. And uh, he knew my family just because of the last names. He was like, oh, yeah, I know your grandma. That's so impressive. Yeah. That's incredible. So, Growing up, like, give us a snapshot. Like, what did you guys grow? How did, you know, what was your, what was your, what was your childhood like in that when you talk about being really connected Mm -hmm. in your family and community? What did that look like? Uh, It looked like (laughs) I got my first gun at five years old. Mm -hmm. I hunted the same squirrel tree lines as my grandma did and my great grandma. Wait, your grandma grandma and great grandma. Yeah. Whoa, hold the phone. (laughs) I, no wonder Carly reminds you of your grandma. (laughs) Like, I'm just like, well, now I get it. Like, uh, your grandmas were badasses. Oh, well, see, so for Phil to Grill, I always say all of this stuff that I'm teaching or I'm introducing other people, it's literally what I learned from my grandparents. Yeah. And on down that line, including my dad too. Yeah. And five years old, you get a gun. You go out and you do this, and I'm like, okay, come back, and you're out there by yourself. Yeah. Uh, once we moved into the city, and you're eating squirrel too. I'm assuming we eat everything. Well, yeah, well, because squirrel is actually really good. Because in some states, I'm familiar mm-hmm. with, there's a lot of little kids that will have like squirrel competitions. Yeah. And they'll see who harvests the most amount of squirrels, mm-hmm. and they count tails. Oh and yeah. And they harvest the little drumettes off the legs, and then mm-hmm. they fry them, and oh, they yeah. do a big squirrel fry. Yeah, hundred percent. So you did this. Oh yeah. Well, okay. not in a competition form. The way we did it, it was kind of conservation as it was, because it was the same squirrel line. So, uh, like, say you would start here, and you would only take one squirrel out of each nest, and then you keep going down the line, and then by the end of the season. All those squirrels have been able to reproduce, and then next season you start it all over again. So, like the next day, I would start here, and then the next day I would start here, and you get as many as you would need. So, how many how many squirrels could you sustainably harvest, roughly, from based off your you know recollection, uh, annually? I would have stringers of tails. So a so, lot. Yeah, we're talking like significant ten, numbers. Like yeah, yeah. Even yeah. for deer, because there you were able, you were able to take a deer a day. And then during buck season, I mean, doe season, you could take a buck and a doe a day. 
So a day? Yeah, a day. So they're just this game everywhere. They're not like the um, mule deer out here. There's the smaller white tail. Like yeah. a big one is about 180. Mm -hmm. Is that's going to be your big buck for you? But uh, all the people that moved into town that were older, we would take meat to them. Oh. So we would go coon hunting, possum. Like they weren't getting that kind of food in town. And so it's like, okay, we got enough to feed our family. We got enough to feed our other family over here, extended family, mm -hmm. Jimmy and Joe Bob. And then uh, let's take it into the places where they can't get it. So we're, did you grow up then processing like you know, you'd, you'd harvest, let's say, five deer. Yeah. And you just kind of assembly line process and mm -hmm. work on a distribution, like yes. a community distribution. Yes, but it, that sounds kind of cold. I would <laughs> at it as more of a family get-together gathering. Okay. We well, all I'm get just, together. Yeah, I'm imagining, like, I'm imagining oh, like, maybe, you know, just processing line, right? Like, you're not like a meat processor. Yeah, you're talking about, like, everybody's having coffee and yeah, tea. Yeah, exactly. And, like, yeah, okay. You have this the deer is, hanging up in outside, yeah. and you got the little ones. It's like, okay, this is what your job is, and you give them a knife, and then they're doing this, and then they grow up, and then that next little ones come up. Uh -huh. So that's how that's so how we it. So was it really a fam your family curation? Yes. 100%. Yeah, not, not an assembly line. No, no, this not at all. This is a family curation, <laughs> and this is food for your soul. It was quality time. It was food for your soul. Uh, and even now, today, what I love about it is because you go and you kill an elk, you know how much time it takes oh, and yeah. how much effort it takes. And every time you pull a package out of the freezer, you remember that hunt. Oh, 100%. You remember all of the fun stuff, all of the mistakes that you made, oh. all of the close calls that you had. Mm -hmm. And it makes it that much more enjoyable Im important yeah. yeah and the fact that you get to relive that and share in that memory with people that are at your dinner table that perhaps weren't with you mm -hmm. during that experience exactly and that's so important i think that's one of the most important ways that um we give respect to the harvest is exactly. by uh reliving the memory of that animal and ultimately the sacrifice that they have given um it, for us for our benefit 100 percent. i know a lot, a lot of non-hunters, they see TV and they see people, they might be hooping and hollering. That's fine. I don't care. For me, it, I've never had that kind of take on it. Mm. I've always felt kind of sick to my stomach. Yeah. However, when I take out other people, because I take out vets, uh, Leos, first responders and mm -hmm. kids, I teach them, especially the ones that have never been before. Yeah. When they harvest, I get so happy. Yeah. And I'm like, what? yeah let's do this mm -hmm. but anytime i do something i feel a little sick to my stomach mm -hmm. i take some time because i feel like i'm gonna throw up yeah and then i say thank you yeah, yeah. i had that this year well i have that quite often but this mm -hmm. year i harvested an elk and um i shot him and he went into a drainage or like a cut drainage and i didn't see him go down and i i guess i've kind of gotten to where the last few years have been really good about putting them where they were standing and they yeah. don't go anywhere. And this one kind of ran off and I instantly went into panic mode. I grabbed my husband oh. and we're like running and I'm like, ah, yeah. I mean, like we didn't even do the TV stuff we needed to do oh, because yeah, I, can't. well, I was terrified. Like, I don't want this animal. Is it suffering? Mm -hmm. Is it going to run away? You know, what's going on? I didn't know because visually I lost that connection. And we're walking this, uh, you know, had a little elevation above the creek and when I saw that bull laying there. I just, I started crying. I was so thankful because I did mm -hmm. not want him to be in a situation where, you know, and the shot looked good. It's not that I was yeah. questioning that, but as a hunter and as somebody who loves animals that I hunt, I want to make sure that I, you know, that their death is, yeah. is humane. You're as, doing everything possible be. that you're supposed to be doing. And I was so thankful he was laying right there. He didn't go 50 yards. Yeah. And I just started crying. I was so overjoyed just because, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't suffer. And so I, you know, I, I still like, I still get emotional for the animal because I love them mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that everything I do respects and honors them, even in the, in the manner in which they die. Yeah. A, a hundred thousand percent with that. And uh, even growing up, I've never lost an animal yet. People say it happens. I have never done it. I had a chocolate lab, and I had trained her to uh, hunt down wounded deer, and the people would come and call me, and I would take her nice. out and find theirs. But uh, Veronica, she killed her first uh, cow here, and when she did it, she dropped right where she was at. Yeah. She didn't get up. But we, were, we were 375 yards out, and we had to come down. We left Lonnie and my dad up top, mm -hmm. so they were guiding us. And once you get down into the brush, you can't see where you're going. Mm -hmm. And we walk up on, on, on this cow, and she's sitting up. She mm -hmm. couldn't move. She didn't take one step. She's sitting there. And I was like, well, you got you to finish the job. Yeah. And I'm filming the whole thing. And it was so beautiful because she's starting to, 
she's feeling all of the emotions. Your wife. Yeah. Yes. She's feeling all of the emotions, and she, she pulls up, and I'm filming it. And then, right, you see, like, her breath coming out, and then she just goes, I'm sorry. And then she Aww. shoots. Gosh, yeah. you make me cry. But but it was good because yeah. we talked about that. And I yeah. it was I was like, should I put that in? Should I not put that in? But I like that was 100%. a real moment and I put it in. Yeah. And she was saying the same thing you were saying mm-hmm. then. She was like, I was wondering if it was suffering and mm. I'm glad it didn't run off. And mm-hmm. it was just all of those emotions. Mm-hmm. Because she shot a ram and we had to track that thing for three and a half miles because it only popped one lung. Mm-hmm. And it was like, well, we have to go and get that yeah. one. Yeah. 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 You owe the animal the follow exactly. up. That 100%. And I, I just think that, you know, if we didn't have some level of remorse with the harvest, we would yeah. not be um, the conservationists 100%. that we are. And, um, you know, that's part of why we protect and preserve um, to the capacity that, that hunters do, because mm-hmm. we all feel that, you know, as part yeah. of um, as part of the harvest. So let's talk. You're, you're talking about taking first responders, mm-hmm. other kids. Let's talk about how you're mentoring, too. Uh, well, after the military, I became a child and family therapist. And so I did that for a while. Um, that got me into mainstream entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how I ended up in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And so I've done a lot of that kind of thing. thing and I've always helped. I love helping people that are trying to help themselves. And that was me giving back. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was another show called The Grateful Nation with our Ranger Tim, Tim, Tim Abel. And he wanted me to come on as a film director for his yeah. show. And then he, he was like... Right now, you know how to do all of this stuff in front of the camera, behind the camera. Why don't you just do it for you? Because you're yeah. doing it anyway. And I found I was looking for a way, and uh, and I found it. And I was like, all of this makes sense. It's, it's like I just have to film what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And bringing the veterans and law enforcement, it helps being out in the wilderness. It helps going out fishing on a lake. Mm. Sometimes you're talking, sometimes you're not. All of the downtime, and I've had I've had so many just blessed moments where people's lives have been changed just from being out one time. Hi, I'm Christy Titus. And if you're like me, then you have become completely reliant upon the Onyx Hunt app. For me, the key feature of the app has always been GPS capabilities. But as technology has evolved, so has Onyx Hunt. Within the Onyx Hunt app, you're gonna find the same great features that we've grown to rely on, like knowing public and private land boundaries and specific landowner information, which allows us to hunt with confidence, even in areas without service. The offline feature allows you to download maps in advance, and then you can store them for in-field use where service is limited or non-existent. And the cool thing is you can still mark waypoints and have full GPS capabilities while you're offline. When it comes to using the map itself, you can customize the layers that are shown within your map. And there are numerous hunt specific layers that you can select like roadless areas, game management units by species, timber cuts, historic wildfires, and even RMEF has a layer that you can use to identify habitat improvement projects in the area that you're hunting. It will even show you detailed weather information. One of my favorite features of the Hunt app is the ability to share waypoints with your friends and family. And just in case you have a falling out with your hunting buddy, don't worry, Onyx Hunt has your back. You can actually remove the share option from their app even after you've given it to them. I trust all my hunts with the Onyx Hunt app, and you should too. You can download your free trial today in the App Store. I'm not gonna say this person's name, but I took him on an antelope hunt. His wife was 1,000% against it. Mm -hmm. He's another calf guy. And um, we went out, harvested. His wife was like, you know, he's, he's so different now. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what's going on? And now she pushes him out. Now like, she you need to go to do go. something. You need to go mm-hmm. do something. And now his kid is doing it as well. And uh, he's smiling. Mm-hmm. He's smiling now instead of being a grumpy old There's guy. There's <laughs> books that are written about um, just the natural inclination in the human soul and the human spirit to be a hunter and gatherer. Oh, it is. And 100%. It, there's something that is completely... Um, of mind, body, spirit that occurs when you're out there in the field. And and we lose, I think, being in a city or never having been Mm -hmm. exposed to hunting. Like, we don't even know what we're missing. Yeah. 
um, until you get and have that experience. And it is life changing for so many people. Oh yeah. And and it, it is so therapeutic for the soul. I mean, um, a long time ago, Cabela's did this whole marketing program called the Disconnect Day, and it was a challenge for families mm-hmm. to disconnect the phone, the TV, yeah. whatever, and just take some time and be out in your with your family in, in nature. And, um, you know, you made that pledge, and then, you know, the hope would be that if you've made a pledge to your family that you mm-hmm. honor that pledge and and create those moments that we're talking about yeah. and, and have that fundamental that opportunity to change people fundamentally. Um, yeah. So you're taking kids too then? Yes. We actually, we're going to be doing a uh, youth waterfowl hunt. Two years ago, I think we had like 60. Last year we had 90. You're taking 90 kids yeah. waterfowl So hunting. we're getting, well, it's more than just me. It's uh, well, the Battle Born Ducker yeah, guys. Yeah. It's the wind guys. Endow's yeah. uh, involved. And you're getting the parents that have never hunted. They're coming mm-hmm. out like, what is this going on? Uh, Rock Island, they donate guns. All the kids walk away with something, whether it's yeah. you know, it's like a grab bag calls. Yeah. They have calling contests and win stuff like that. So it's very interactive. So when I go, I go from blind to blind to blind and talk to everyone. Mm-hmm. So like you might be a mentor and you can take three kids into yours or three kids and the dad or the mom or whoever's yeah. coming out. And then we've been seeing that that's also have been bringing new hunters in. A hundred percent. Yeah, because like bird hunting, rabbit hunting, stuff like that, it's more interactive. Yeah. Than Deer hunting, which you might and not see it's, anything. And it's lower cost on, the, on the, there's the barrier of entry is reduced yes. by reduced expenses associated with participation in mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Well, I preach that because a lot of the times uh, that obstacle of getting into something is too much. It's like you don't have to get, you don't have to pay 500 or $800 mm-hmm. for a jacket. You can go and get something from the Goodwill. Absolutely. Go and then figure out what it is that you need. Mm-hmm. And then you can start going piece by piece by mm-hmm. piece instead of being out three grand first off and you don't even get anything because you don't yeah. know what you're doing. Well, and it's really important, I think, too, that, that people that are hunters that have old gear, that they find a place to recycle their gear. Um, I donate to a lot of nonprofits. Mm-hmm. There's one in particular called the First Hunt Foundation, and um, they have roughly 40 mentors throughout the country in different states and locations and chapters around the country. And I contact Rick and I, you know, I've donated bows and boots. I brought him a truckload of gear one year, <laughs> like three bows, boxes of boots. Some of them I'd never worn, but like yeah. for like a photo shoot or something. Mm-hmm. And I mean, old clothing, you know, patterns change, yeah. skews change. I mean, we're constantly changing and upgrading our gear. And, you know, I'm in a very blessed position mm-hmm. where I get new stuff pretty much every year. Yeah. So I am constantly giving. And, and that's a great way for us to keep these kids mm-hmm. um, and remove that barrier of in- entry that allows a mom um, that maybe doesn't have the funds to, to allocate into exactly. outfitting a kid to provide them with that opportunity. Yeah. And for most hunters, they <coughs> they are willing to help other people. If they're true conservationists, they're true sportsmen, they're like, they'll see you out there trying, they'll see you out there doing, and they're like, hey, you know what? I have this X amount piece of gear. Yeah. This will help you. I don't even use it anymore. Here yeah. you go. And you just, it's, and that's how it is. Well, and when we see it, it with schools, too. They do clothing drives and coat drives, and um, that's what I should do this year is organize a, a gear drive for donations for old hunting gear for it's kids. Easy. It's easy. It's so easy. To, <coughs> you, can do it in your, you can do it in your own town. You can just start a Facebook group, mm-hmm. something like that. Even if five people come on, that's five people that provide have an a, opportunity have for a garage full of stuff that is just yeah. sitting in a box and they're mm-hmm. not using it that somebody else can use. Yep, 100%. I think that's a great way to give back. Um, in addition to mentoring, yeah. that's I, you know, 90 kids, that's incredible. That's a lot of little humans and souls that you're touching. And, and just think about the legacy long term that that has an opportunity to impact. That's mm-hmm. tremendous. Like, you should be so proud about that. You know, that's, that's yeah. something that's really special. I don't <laughs> see it as uh, something being pr- to be proud of. I just see it that that's how I was raised and that's what we mm-hmm. did. Um, like, for instance, we were driving one time, me and my dad, and uh, my dad and I, and, <laughs> and he's going grammar <laughs> on us. <laughs> and we were we were driving, and we have like tons of pecans. We yeah. have the shoes pecan factory there. We uh, we would fill that. We get money, filling up five gallon buckets, coming to town, get some money, and then mm-hmm. that's what we did. And we were out there, and there was a, this group of old elderly people. They're out there with a cane pole trying to get the pecans out. Mm-hmm. My dad said, "Hey, we're going to go and help them." So we go and we help them, and then they try to give me money. And I was like, yeah. And my dad said, no, no, that's not what we're doing here. And I didn't get it until 
because I was mad because I'm like, well, there's a fan. Is that, yeah. And like years later, when I found myself doing that kind of stuff, and one, I, I was helping somebody out for nothing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, that's what we're supposed to do. And it mm-hmm. triggered that memory back for me. And I was like, I called my dad and I was like, hey, I get it. He's, like, like, what, like, he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, thanks, dad, for, for being such an incredible man. Because we're supposed to, we're supposed to help each other out. Yeah. Oh, man. I, that is, that is, the, that is so true. And it, al- it also was kind of sad because I feel like so many people, it's so easy just to turn a shoulder and say, this isn't yeah. my problem. Uh, someone else will deal with it. Let the government fix this. Um, and, and it really is up to us to reach out and into our own communities. It's always going to be up to us if the government fails, if the world fails, and we lose the Internet and we lose electricity, we lose running water all again. We're going to have to rely on each other. Mm. You can't do it by yourself. No. So. And, and we're not as effective um, individually as we are collectively. Exactly. And that's a fact. You know, we, it takes a team. They always say it takes a village to raise kids, but mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't know. <laughs> but, um, are you trying to say something? No, <laughs> it's tacos. I swear I'm not having a baby. Um, but uh, no, it is, it is so true. And so what you're doing, yeah, I mean, like the whole journey, you know, your service in the military, your service to your community, it's, it's really ins- awe-inspiring for me. Um, and I didn't realize that you had such an extensive background, like, in psychology and mm-hmm. what, I mean, like, I had no idea. You probably have shrunk my brain and are like, why am I doing this podcast? This woman's a psycho. No, <laughs> not at all. I, you know what? I'm just teasing just, you. Just like I'm Carly, teasing. I love you and I love everything that you're doing because people can look up at, look up to you and you're doing it in such a positive light. It's not to where, you know the wives of somebody can say, well, no, you can't look at her because she's, you know, got her yeah. everything hanging out. That yeah. kind of thing is yeah. like, I'm walking the walk and I'm talking the talk. Yeah. And you've said to me several times, like, hey, is there anything you need? Mm. And I'm like, not yet. I'm not where I need something because yeah. I don't want to do that. But if it's he's not, really he's need. saving that car. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, Christy. And you're like, who? What? He's Who's saving this? that guy. <laughs> We're going to get there. Don't worry. We're going to get there. So your show, where does your show air? Where can people watch Field to Grill? And in what you're doing. So I had a 22-episode uh, deal for one of the networks oh. right before Corona hit. And I had to go to Canada, Alaska, and then I was going over to Australia to mm. shoot. And then all that got shut down. So I am literally sitting on episodes right now. Dude, and, edit uh, them and put them on Carbon TV. I have thought about it, but yeah, the, deal is, the deal is still kind of open. Oh, okay, gotcha. And, uh, so you have a full season <laughs> of episodes that we can't watch. <laughs> yes, but everything else is like, you know, just, you know, reviews here and yeah. me talking about this there. Yeah. And I do take clips of stuff and put it out there. On but your it's social? Not on a social. Your social media page, your Instagram makes me hungry every time I go on there. I'm like, oh my gosh. And your wife is tiny. Veronica is not. She's the tiniest woman. I think I would weigh 500 pounds if I lived no. in your house. You know what? She She runs marathons and she looks like she's tiny, but she's... Stout. She's, like, she's a stout yeah, lady. She's yeah, she's heavy. She's stout lady. Well, I got yelled at the other day because I said Don't ever something. say a woman's weight. I said, I said <laughs> oh, it was for, it was for the, poly, uh, the women's wear and stuff. And I was like, you know, yeah, she's stout and whatnot. And she had the same issues, but she looked, she's small. Yeah. Yeah. But if you go to pick her up, you might break yeah. her back. Yeah. So <laughs> you're, you're, my husband, he can't carry me. My thighs are like twice as big as Yogi's. I swear it's awful. It's really embarrassing. Like, like, like he, he always jokes about having bird legs and then I have, I stand next to him and I'm like, have these giant thighs, but I swear, I feel like my legs, you know, they, they have a lot of stamina and oh, yeah. that's how you get up the mountains. They're, oh yeah. That's how you get up. Cause they're big. Yeah. They're large and in charge. <laughs> Tree trunk thighs. Uh, let's talk. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No, it's yeah. well, you know, whatever. It's fine. Um, let's talk a little bit about your two way advocacy. Like what you're doing around the Second Amendment and how you feel about the Second Amendment. and Growing up, uh, guns were just a part of life. Uh, yeah, yeah. You had one at five, we, so it, yeah. for sure. When we came into town and I was still working, I was working on the dairy farms, Bruce Ivey's dairy farm. Uh, he's passed on now. And uh, we would come out, milk the cows. Were we By hand or were you using machines then? No machines at this okay. point. It, okay. it, it, was, it was all miracles. I was like imagining. No. We, we did that. You like we did that in the country. <laughs> milking a cow. This was from Metal Gold. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. Okay. It was like an operation, but it was yeah. out in the boonies. It was yeah. like a, a factory of yeah. cows. Like we would have to go out with three, three wheelers. We'd go out with three wheelers and horses, round up the cows every morning, bring yeah. them in, milk them, set them back out into the okay. pastures and the woods and the swamps. And um, we would hunt, milk, 
go to school. We could bring our guns to school. Yeah. Uh, and then get back off, milk, hunt again, and that was the day. Yeah, you were a very active child. Well, we there was no internet. And, and there uh, was nothing else to do. <laughs> and there's still no internet there. <laughs> there's nothing to do apart from milk cows. But we, we, we would sit around and talk and telling stories. It was all about that storytelling. And, hey, we're going to go see, you know, Uncle James and see if they need anything mm-hmm. done. And uh, Bruce Ivy had three catfish ponds. And so I was like, hey, can I come down and, like, scan catfish during the summertime when people come out? And he was like, yeah. And then my dad was like, hey. Wait, don't what t- is skinning a catfish? You don't. Catch catfish? I have caught catfish <laughs> as a child, but I have I have never skinned a catfish. I, I'm so sorry. I just assumed. <laughs> so catfish, they have skin on them. So some fish have scales and other fish have skin. Okay. So you literally, you, you cut around the head. Okay. You just a little incision all the way around and you get catfish skinners. We use pliers because I don't think they had made catfish skinners or they okay. cost too much money. And you grip the skin and then you just pull peel it off. It. You peel so it off. So kind of like, like when you fist like a soft hide as you're caving yes. a deer. So it's warm. You can put your hand in there and just roll the hide off. Yes. It's the same kind of thing. But it's much easier than that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So I had no idea. Yeah, that. because it's slimy. Okay. So you can't eat it. It's not like salmon. No, no, no. You don't yeah. want to eat it. Yeah. And okay. then you just gut it and then it's over and it's done. And I would do that for people that would come out. And in my mind... This is, I can earn money doing this. Yeah, for sure. And then my dad's mind was like, no, don't accept any money from anyone. You're just mm. going to do it. Mm-hmm. And then one time I did accept money. And I got a whooping. I was going to say, <laughs> I, could, I know where this is going. <laughs> I know exactly where this is going. I got a whooping and I had to go and apologize that I accepted money and then tried to give it to back to uh, Mr. Ivy. And uh, he wouldn't take it. He just like, yeah, this is. It's just between us. Yes, I still got a whip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got beat, but I got two dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was something like that too. <laughs> it was so worth that chocolate yeah. bar I got at the store. <laughs> I just fed you chocolate too, by the way. It was your I, blood I took sugar. It. I'm your blood good. sugar was crashing. This, this is the last day, and uh, I'm, yeah, I could well, take a nap. We're like two years in the making on this. Let's be honest, because yes. we were going to do this shot show last year. A year it was a year by. ago. It blows my mind. And uh, I don't know what happened, but everybody I was supposed to podcast with last year successfully canceled on me. And this year, everybody came through, and I'm like, winning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was held up at another booth filming another deal, and it went on way longer than it needed to. Yeah. And I was like, uh, yeah. Sorry, like, Christy. This is getting I, awkward. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not gonna make it. It's okay. It's like, I forgive you. I forgive you. I didn't forgive myself. Yeah, I know it's all yeah. good. So you have in your household, you guys have your hunting rifles. You have shotguns, mm-hmm. handguns, you, bows. So are you concealed carry? Are you a concealed carrier? Are you active 100%, on that? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred thousand percent. Yeah. Uh, you guys train a lot. You train a lot, or what do you? What do you? What's your practice with that? The last couple of months, there's been almost zero training because of all of the shows that have been going I on. I haven't trained in the last two months on my kid's sealed carry either. So <laughs> don't, like, beat yourself up on that. It's Wyoming in the winter. <laughs> well, however, here, uh-huh. however, there's a lot to be said for dry fire practice. Exactly. But, again, again exactly. like you, I am, I am yeah, I'm even slacking with, on it. Even with dry fire, even if you just wake up before you leave the house, five runs. Dry firing before you go put a post-it note with a dot on it. You do that. If you do that every day and you don't have time to go to the range, it's better than doing nothing at all. Is that something that you're pretty consistent on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You're very responsible in in that. That's wonderful. I believe... it's it's so not do you only have it's like, a responsibility. Yeah, do you have like a firearm? Do you have like okay, I have this firearm. It has snap caps. This is my practice pistol, and then that's the other one I carry. Or how? how what's no, your system? I have different uh, firearms depending on what part of the country I'm going to be mm-hmm. in. Uh, clothing I'm going to be wearing when I'm out here in Nevada during the summertime. Mm-hmm. I, sm- I carry this little small little pocket pistol deal because yeah. I wear shorts. Mm-hmm. Instead of like a full frame MP. What M&P. he means is he actually carries an LCP 2380. <laughs> Veronica carries that, actually. <laughs> and it's that Tiffany blue or whatever that is. Color it, oh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really. Well, she very didn't pick it. I bought it. Color. I bought it yeah. for her. Yeah, <laughs> so she okay. didn't pick it. Yeah. She's, she's more like. Nothing pink, nothing purple, the, the nothing pink flashy. It, the pink it and shrink it can get a little <laughs> insulting to us ladies, so that, I get that, yeah. I've been preaching that yeah. time and time again. So bad. And we have so many women now that are coming in, and um, 
it's kind of condescending when you have somebody 100%. talk down to you. Yeah. And I'm very aware and very conscious. I try to call it out, mm. but in a nice way. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's no difference between you and I, except for I can open a jar of pickles easier. That's about it. Well, it's just because you have giant paws or hands. <laughs> okay, let us be clear. I have seen some women that have big hands. Okay, but just not me. So, yeah, you're right. It was very mm -hmm. condescending, especially when, uh, I forget who it was, and it came out with that women's camouflage, and it was pink and oh, camoed boy. out. And, like, nobody's buying it. And no, like, people think? did. People did buy well, it. Well, they were not the hunters. Yeah, it was, like, toothpaste <laughs> pink with shrubs on did it. Did you buy something. some? No. Yeah, see? I, you know, and I get, so I'm so weird. I get super offended. And people say huntress uh -huh. in every meaning of, like, in every, like, trying to be well-meaning statement. Oh, she's a huntress. It's a well-meaning statement. And I'm like, do you call your doctor a doctoress? Ooh, that's a good one. Do you call your <laughs> an attorney an attorneyress? Yeah. Like, no, the S at the end to me is condescending a hunter is a hunter male or female 100%. a doctor is a doctor male or female 100%. attorney is an attorney male or female and so the s on the end yes yeah uh, I, don't, I don't dig that i don't dig it so much i'm like no um i'm a hunter thank you it's yeah non and i think that that's another and i'm thing not that's saying i'm non-binary okay oh, so don't no, go there it's, <laughs> no it's not that it's more no. <laughs> it's more of like no. a separation yeah. and saying okay you can be a part of this but you're still this a is girl. your this is your lane. Still a girl. But at the end of the day, like I was talking about my grandma, yeah. they all did all of this stuff. Everything. But it wasn't considered like, oh, women don't do this, women do this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like that at all. Yeah. And you travel the world and in some places it is. In mm -hmm. other places it's not. But what I found is like especially with archery, that women take to it easier than men and they're more accurate quicker. And yeah. I, I don't know what, what it is about it. Or do you like paying more attention? Is it your makeup? Whatever the case it is. It, my makeup definitely helps um, yeah. um, <laughs> um, elevate me to a whole other level of perfection. I uh, <laughs> Definitely a strong turnover from when I wake up to where I look like in the <laughs> afternoon. So that's always the makeup that helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No. <laughs> In case you didn't know. Well, we, Veronica, we were up on the mountain, and she, she was like, oh, it was probably four or five days in, and she was like, I'm not putting on makeup. I was like, you don't need to. She was like, no, these other people are doing it. And then I showed Melissa Bachman came oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she goes, look, she's got makeup, and she's out here. I was like, ah. That's not what we're thinking about. She like the next time she brought a bag of stuff. Yeah. I was like, "Come on, man!" <laughs> I, you know, I filmed with kind of a uh, a producer this fall, and and he hadn't really he well, I hadn't filmed with him before, and uh -huh. and then he, he, we were at an event this week. He's like, "You know, it's really weird. Like we slept in a tent for a week, and miraculously, like somehow <laughs> you still had makeup on the whole time." He's like, "And I don't even remember you doing that." I'm like. Yeah, because I'm that fast. <laughs> Were you doing it every day? Oh, I do. oh well, yeah, like okay. I do. You know, here's the deal. I was raised that big hair takes you closer to Jesus. Uh -huh. So I always have like this 80s bouffant going on. <laughs> like it's bad. And then, you know, always makeup. Like when I was a little kid, my mom didn't go anywhere without makeup. And I remember uh. I, I sat on her lap one time and she was coming to my school and I put my hands on either side of her cheeks and I said, Mom. When you come to my school today, will you please wear makeup? <laughs> and my mom's like, you little friggin' brat. <laughs> but, you know, like, that's just how I was raised. We, he, I always wore makeup. Like, my mom always mm -hmm. wore makeup. The women around me always wore makeup. They always did their hair. They always looked good um, for their husbands or for whatever. You know, I like, that, that was just, yeah. you know, my mom to this day, she gets up every day. She fixes her hair. She puts on her makeup, and she looks good for her man. And mm -hmm. and that's my dad. Um, so <laughs> happy about that still. Um, and I and I think that that's important. I think it's an important part of their marriage that you know neither one of my parents have let themselves go. Mm -hmm. um, you know that goes into you know being physically fit too. You know so yeah. for me, you know I'm not getting up only every day and putting on makeup. I get up every day and I go work out. You know so for me it's it's uh, it's a respect to my marriage. It's a respect mm -hmm. to my body and. And some people like to make fun of that, and I, yeah, I really don't care. You yeah, know. Well, <clears> it's it, fine. It, it, it and if you don't want to do it, you don't too. have to do it. Exactly. Like to me, I don't care if you wear makeup or not. But leave me alone that I'm wearing makeup, okay? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's about like, shaming. It's about yeah. shaming too, because it's like you should be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Or why are you being subservient? It's not even. It's not yeah. even that at all whatsoever. My husband would never describe me as subservient. <laughs> 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 Just put that out there. <laughs> Ever. <laughs>
<laughs> Actually, uh, everybody here at the Ruger booth has shook my husband's hand and been like, you get your hands full. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. <laughs> but that means For he sure. doesn't have to worry about anything. <laughs> if you're off somewhere by yourself yeah. doing something, no. you don't need protection. You can protect each other. And yeah. that's what a relationship yeah. is all about is yeah. the give and the push. Give and take. 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 <laughs> push and pull. <laughs> Whatever. Same push. difference. It's giving and pushing. Yeah, yeah. It's, fine. <laughs> it's fine. No, your wife is awesome. She is She's a badass and she's super supportive of everything you do in the outdoors and she's also active in it and I think um, the fact that you guys have that that unique bond mm-hmm. um, it really is, is it helps solidify a happier healthier I think relationship and there are a lot of people there um, you know they go hunting and, and there's a lot of men that are like man I like going without my wife mm-hmm. and and that's just how they were raised and they have that mentality and that's that works in their marriage um, but for me you know I am so fortunate like you mm-hmm. I get to do these experiences with my best friend and my spouse and man I, I wouldn't I mean I go out and I do stuff like that and my husband's not there I was like well my best friend don't get to do this it's sad yeah you know it's about sharing yeah i was out on on an elk hunt and i was out there three days before she was kind of come up and i came out the tent middle of the night and i just looked up and you could see the colors Mm. in the sky with the milky way and Mm -hmm. everything and it was so beautiful it looked fake and i'm just taking it all in and i'm like i'm the only one out here Mm -hmm. that sees this my dog Mm -hmm. wasn't even there yet oh man and you can't take a picture of it. No. You can't really even describe it. Yeah. But I was like, I wish you were here for this. I Aww. wish. That, I was like, I wish anybody was here with yeah. me for this. Just to explore. So, yeah. We did that. We really, um, this, uh, this last fall was our first season hunting Wyoming, and, and we cashed out our mm. non-resident points. So my husband was there, and I was there, and my producer, Nick, and Nick has traveled with me. Well, I've known Nick longer than my husband and Mm -hmm. he's like a brother um and it was so warm outside and so beautiful that after we would eat our you know freeze-dried dinners we were so removed from people we could see the milky ways just with your plain sight and like we would lay down outside of our tent at night for like 20 minutes and just Mm -hmm. stare at the sky in quiet and talk about being grounded it was so beautiful like and that's the first time i have in a long time done that because number one if I'm cold I want to be in my sleeping bag <laughs> so uh, it was nice that it was warm enough that we could do that and really have that connection but it is it is a really like what you're talking about it is it is awe it is awestruck like you're oh my gosh this is yeah. so spectacular because when you're in a city like we're in Vegas right now there's mm-hmm. so much light pollution yeah you don't see any sky yeah you but know? you drive I mean, 25 minutes outside of here it's beautiful it's a whole other world. Mm-hmm. But people and great think, hunting. Yeah, I mean, fantastic hunting. We're in over 90% BLM land. Yeah. We have all the big game here. Yeah. And Sheep, you just got to get deer, out there and do elk, it. elk, mountain lions. Yeah. You, know, you got it all. And Veronica, didn't. she didn't grow up hunting. She's no. from South L.A. So did you introduce her to hunting then? I introduced her to archery. Okay. And I was like, okay, it was going to be about a year before. Like, don't expect anything. And then within three months, she's like, boom, boom, She's boom, a master boom. at it. And she was like, hey, I want to go hunting with you. And I told her, I was like, if you go, you're going to have to do everything. Yeah. And she goes, okay. And she went and she hasn't looked back. Yeah, she since. loves it. Changed yeah. her life. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's impressive. But she also rifle hunts too, right? She, she does yeah. everything. Yeah, I thought yeah. so. Yeah. She, she loves fishing and she loves uh, duck hunting because it's more like, Action packed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of boom boom going on. But she likes it all. She, I think yeah. she likes the food portion. She was like, this is the only way we're going to be able to get it. So, yeah, mm-hmm. you have to like it. We um, we were in Germany for Christmas this year, and they do um, like a traditional duck. A lot of the German families oh. do a traditional duck. And, you know, I've not really eaten duck. I'm not a bird hunter, you know. Um, I have been duck hunting, but like uh-huh. literally, I think once. Um, I know, don't don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had this traditional duck dinner, and it was delicious. Um, in fact, I'm going to switch now. I don't really care for turkey. Okay. Um, not, I mean, they call birds fowl for a reason. Cause oh, turkey no. Is no. It's all right. You're I mean, cooking it right. turkey's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I, I'm just not a big turkey chicken fan, right? Like, I eat it, and, and you know, sometimes I'm, it tastes really good to me. Other times I'm like, meh. Um, but the duck, I'm like, we're not doing Thanksgiving turkey anymore. We're doing Thanksgiving duck from now on. Like, it was awesome. And I looked at my husband, I'm like, maybe, maybe we need to take up duck hunting maybe we're missing out Why on not? something here because the duck breast come out next like there year. was a whole little duck mm-hmm. with two ducks and we crushed them we ate the whole things yeah and there was like all of the drippings in the bottom of mm-hmm. the the duck breast 
where the little bottom of the carcass was sitting in the pan. And my husband was over there like a raven, scavenger, yeah. like whatever. And he has the duck flipped over and he's like, <laughs> like, like, like picking apart this duck. And I'm like, are you going to like gnaw the bones in half or like what's going on? So apparently we're now doing duck. I mean, well, <laughs> check, so check this out. So you had the carcass that was left over yeah. after he gnawed at it like a caveman. Yeah. If you take he reminded <laughs> me that of that guy on Lord of the Rings with the ring. Ah, oh, yeah, the precious. Yeah, he was good. You didn't want to touch the duck. I'm telling you, the duck was off limits. <laughs> if you take that carcass and put it in boiling water, uh-huh. let it boil for 20 minutes and, and simmer. And make like a broth. You make that broth, take it, put it in the freezer, and anytime you're going to make rice or pasta, anything you would normally oh. put water in, you're going to get that same taste from what you were eating from that duck, and it infuses into everything else. Okay, so let's talk some more food tips here. <laughs> I like this transition. I'm, I'm I like saying, this yeah. transition. So, w- do you add onion to your broth, or you just go straight meat, beef broth, or uh, I, duck broth, or whatever it is? So, I do both. Okay. So, if I'm going to do just a straight duck broth, like I, I have a, a goose in the fridge right now, I'm dry aging. And so, that I'm only going to do the bones once I'm done. Okay. When I'm cooking and I do like onion scans, the garlic scans, uh, ends of celery, anything that you you have, like the a scraps. Com- what I would normally throw away, like We're compost. In a compost. Yeah. Any yeah. of that stuff you throw away a compost, put it in a Ziploc bag, throw it in your freezer. Okay. Once you get about three gallons worth, pull so them out. So three, three of the three big packages, Ziploc bags. Okay. Pull them out, start your water in a big stock pot, throw all of those in there. And then if you have some, some bones or whatever it is that you're going to be doing, mm-hmm. you can either have just a veggie stock or you can have like a... Um, Milk. Yeah, bones. so like take the bones with the marrow and you just in throw it. it in there. Yeah, you throw it in there. Same thing. I do mine for 24 hours. Then I strain it. Do you boil it or are you simmering or what's I the? boil okay. and then I simmer for 24 hours. Ooh. So okay. you bring it just to a boil. Yep. And then kick it to a simmer. And then kick it and just let it sit. Mm. And then if you just strain all of that, I put everything in different mason jars and throw it in. I have to write what it is. Throw them back in the freezer and then you're good. Then you can pull it out and you're like, okay, I know I'm going to make a... Uh, uh, rice or a jambalaya or something like that. And I use that for my roux as well for like um, uh, gumbo. So, because you're, really think about it, if you're going to make rice, you're just going to use water. So, why not add flavor to it? Why not make and, it amazing? And if you go and get bouillon from the store that's it's like gross. full of salt yeah. and whatever else they put in it, yeah. but this, you know exactly what it is. And it goes back to using every part of the animal yeah. because you've already eaten that, that bird. And now you get a whole other mm-hmm. bunch of different meals out of it. Mm-hmm. And it's good for you. Yeah, it's super matter, good for you. Matter of fact, when Holly Berry was talking about eating uh, or drinking bone broth, and Veronica was like, hey, we should buy bone broth. And I said, we have tons of it in the freezer. She goes, we do? I was like, what do you think all of that stuff is? <laughs> <laughs> is she cooking with you or are you no. on your own? No, no, she no. She cooks three dishes, and they're all a variation of spaghetti. <laughs> 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 she was supposed to <laughs> so funny. Do, do you want spaghetti <laughs> spaghetti or spaghetti no, she, <laughs> and it's all the same she doesn't cook matter of fact you know you try to do like the side stuff and it's like hey cut the onions or cut this up I'm like, you know what? Just don't do anything. I got by this. The time, I'm like, you're already screwing it up and now I got to refix it. I got to do this. So you're cooking. <laughs> Does she do dishes then? Uh, what? No. That, yeah. was a, that was the agreement. But I, I just throw them in a dishwasher now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, at least we no. don't have to hand, we, I hate no. hand washing. She'll make dishes. a drink for me. Well, that's <laughs> nice. She's the, she's the, Veronica's the bartender of the house. Yeah, that's, you know, this is fantastic. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make some broths when I get home. Um, I've been really, like, um, one of the guys from Night Force, he, he made this, like, epic chili. Mm-hmm. And, man, it was so good. And I keep, I love chili. And it's such a great, like, hearty stick to your ribs oh, winter yeah. dish. And oh, it's yeah. so yummy. And I keep saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But, like, Yogi and I have been going home, and we'll be home, like, three days. Mm-hmm. And we get back on the road again, and it's like, I don't ever get, like, mentally, physically caught up enough to like create food or create dishes and i just find myself getting in this slump where yeah. we eat ground meat patties and raw veggies like <laughs> over and over again so, so to spice that up uh this is what i do because i do a ton of traveling as well yeah 
Uh, are you guys like strictly out in the woods or do you guys ever like stay in hotels or do you have electricity? Uh, yeah. So th- we just ordered, <laughs> we just ordered a new horse trailer. It's okay. It's getting okay. built and it's insulated and it's going to have one ten, So I'll be able to plug a generator into mm-hmm. it. And um, so we'll be able to call the horses in it. We'll be able to camp out of it and like put like okay. in the back. We'll be able to plug in like a heater. Got it. And then have like a cook stove back there and have cots and, and we can put our side by side in it. So this year we're going to be gonna like glamping. Gotcha. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're like, oh, whatever. No, no, no. I, I winked at him. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Just showed up. It was right over there. Um, so, th- there's this thing called the hot logic. Okay. And uh, it, it breaks down to about this big. They have a smaller one, too, but you're going to need the bigger one. Okay. So, you were talking about chili. Oh, yeah. During those three days that you're there, you make your chili. Then you put them all in um, a vacuum sealed bag. Yeah. Like enough for two people or three people or whatever. Throw it in your cooler. When you guys go out for the day and for hunting, you just plug it in. It doesn't take up no more than one light bulb, and then it cooks everything for you, or it heats it up for you. So if it's, if it's all raw, it'll mm. be cooked by the time you get back. If it's cooked already, it'll just keep it at whatever temperature. Really? Yes, And hot it's logic. called hot, hot logic. logic. They're only like $39 on Amazon or something like that. Really? So when I'm out on the road, that's how I have all of that stuff. Because people are like, how are you cooking this? And I was like, I'll cook it at home. And then just bring it. Bring it and put it on the hot Throw it logic. on there. And, and like it takes two and a half hours to cook it. Yeah. And then if it's, it's think raw. about like a crock pot. Yeah. And it just keeps it at that level. And then you pull it, put it on whatever you're going to put it on or eat it straight out of the deal. I have these silicone um, kind of like containers mm-hmm. that, that are food grade. Mm-hmm. And they break down to like this. So it doesn't take up any space. Oh, that's so everything handy. fits into a small Tupperware mm-hmm. container. What are so. some of your other major like camping food hacks? Camping food hacks. Um, spices. Yeah. Uh, they sell, uh, I forget the name of the people, but they sell their spices as well as like when you go to the grocery store, but they have little packets. Yeah. Like like in a like a paper pouch. It's not paper. It's like the, it's sil- silver. It's like a silver. Foil or something? It's like, it's not, yeah, let's call it foil. It's like that. We're going to settle on yeah, foil. Yeah, it's, it's foil. Ish. <laughs> um, I like that stuff because you can bring it with you when mm. you're up on a mountain for when you're just sitting up there. And the other piece that I like about it is that it can be a piece of our survival gear because it has a reflective uh, oh, yeah, pattern yeah. Terms in case you need to yeah. call somebody. My husband so. eats um, seasoning pouches out of his palm and he'll like pour powdered <laughs> seasoning into his hand and he's licking it and he doesn't snort it. So that's <laughs> one good thing. Um, but like Aromat, do you do you cook with Aromat? I don't know what that it's is. It's like a nor. K N O R R, mm-hmm. like the soup company, makes it, and it's like a big thing in Europe. And so he'll like eat aromat, and then like he'll <laughs> find barbecue spices and he eats them. And I literally, my spice rack at my house is re- like shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf. If I see yeah. a spice, I buy it. Yeah. Right? I'm horrible. And I knew we were meant to be the first time. Um, <laughs> we met. <laughs> I should say this. Uh, I was living with my parents, and he was in Europe. And, and in between trade shows, he went home with my par- to stay at my parents with me. Um, and he unzipped his suitcase, and he had container after container of food spices he was oh, taking yeah. back to Europe. And I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, we just became soulmates. I do the same thing. Because we are always buying spices. But mm-hmm. he, like, will pour stuff in his hands and lick it. And yeah. it's like we go to a, a Chinese restaurant or mm-hmm. get sushi. He's literally drinking the soy sauce. <laughs> I'm like, much. what is going That's on here? Too far. So he's crazy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, spices, we love spices. Like they make all the difference in the world. And so we're, oh, yeah. we always try to pack those seasonings along, mm-hmm. especially if you have a fresh harvest and you want to enjoy the meat. Exactly. Um, we do on our tenderloins and back straps, we started cooking those with the 500 degree method. Mm-hmm. And that has worked tremendously well. So like you take the oven, you turn it on 500 degrees and you cook the meat at 500 degrees, mm-hmm. six minutes per pound. So mm-hmm. if it's a, a three pound, you know, tenderloin, you cook it at six minutes per pound. And then you turn the oven heat off and mm-hmm. you don't open the door. You just leave it in there. And you leave it in there for an hour. And it's always like moist, medium rare, beautiful. Oh, yeah. You slice it and the blood goes bloop out. And, and it's just perfect. Because tenderloins, if you overcook them. Yeah. 
you it's, just destroyed them. It's like, why even do it? Why point? even do them? Because yeah, they're small. Some yeah. of them are real small. Um, and so we've been doing that. And so like this fall, it was really fun. A lot of our hunts, you know, we would roll from one to another and we would bring a tenderloin with us mm. from one hunt into the next. Yeah. And we would share it with people in camp. And, and um, it was really a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, that's the best part, right? The tenderloin it is, is it really is, the best yeah, part. So yeah. we did enjoy that this year. He had he had clients that came over from Europe that harvested a bull elk, and they brought the tenderloins, and we cooked those. And then actually I have some friends in the industry. I have a girlfriend in particular that's been wanting an elk forever. She's always bugging me. Do you have extra elk meat? Do you have extra elk meat? <laughs> well, Yogi had these clients from Europe that couldn't take their elk home. So oh. I called her. I'm like, hey, do you want this elk? And she's like, yes. So it was so cool to be able to you know, know that that elk is now going to, you know, South Carolina Yeah. to, to my friend who doesn't have the opportunity to go elk exactly. hunting and, and yeah. have that experience for herself. And um, that's part of what I love about hunting too is, is sharing. Yeah. 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 I mean, food is, uh, it's, even if you don't speak the same language. Oh yeah. Everybody it, it speaks breaks, food. Yeah. It, you can't go wrong mm-hmm. with it. Oh, one of the things you were asking about, you make your own sausage, right? No, oh, I, okay. I take it. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. I'm gone like probably 250, 300, you know, 275 yeah. days a year. It's really hard. I used to, I have made sausage. Mm-hmm. I don't make my own sausage. So I do want this hack. So, so if you did make your own sausage. If or you, you were to want do, to. Do you take your food to a processor then? Yeah. I do everything myself. So it depends. Depends okay. on time. So, on time, gotcha. Um, like this last year, Yogi processed. Like if we'd shoot a, like a white tail deer or something mm-hmm. that's really small, Yogi and I would process that. However, if it's a big animal or we have like, okay, we just shot an elk and now we're rolling into a whitetail hunt. We don't yeah. have time. We'll 100%. take it. So it just depends. This, the, gotcha. the answer would be it depends. So we have done, we do do both. Gotcha. Do do. Do do. Do do. Okay. Do-do. So let's say you have sausage, whether you made it or the processors made it. If you take actual aluminum foil and you strip your veggies down, whichever veggies you like, but in bigger form so you can pick them up and eat them with your mm-hmm. hand, put them down on the bottom of the foil butter sausage on the top wrap it up it'll look like a hot dog or a corn dog yeah throw them in your cooler when you have your fire going just throw it out in the fire um. 30 minutes everything's cooked it's all in there you don't need utensils or anything just eat and it just pop it just love we yeah. love like red peppers yellow peppers yep. orange peppers whatever and um that would be amazing and mm-hmm. um, one of my favorite thing is green chilies oh yeah roasted green oh. chilies i put a little cream cheese in there and then we have um i try to shoot a pig every year because i love the wild pig sausage no, a little yes. spotted uh spicy hot italian sausage in there and mm-hmm. wrap that thing in bacon Ooh, Ooh making me hungry Cream cheese. All I have is a half a pop tart. I know. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but that's a great hack to put that in foil and then mm-hmm. and then just throw it on the grill and and you're not having to do any cleanup and it's all prepped and at the end of the day nobody wants to mess around with food for hours. Yeah. You're too tired. Yeah. 100%. Especially if it's a late long day. Ugh, you ain't lying. Yeah. Oh, I want to go back to where you were talking about the 500 degree method. Yeah. If you have a grill that can get that high. Yeah. Do the same thing in the grill. And then do a, like a, about an hour smoke on it Ooh. as it comes down. And then it'll just sit in that smoke for like mm-hmm. that hour per pound. And it's going to give it a whole different taste to it. I was doing. And you're doing the same thing. I was doing briskets for a while. Mm. The the um, water bath briskets. Mm-hmm. And those were turning out really good. I have one in the freezer. I'm, I'm getting ready to do a water yeah. bath on it. Yeah. Those are so good. And I, I do love the brisket. Sometimes I have over smoked it a little bit, or I'm like, yeah, a little too much. It here. depends on who it is, yeah, and it depends on what kind of wood that you're using. Yeah, like I, I love the strong smoke, yeah, but I also eat goat as well. Oh, it's a <laughs> goat so and lamb. I can't eat oh. lamb either. My husband See? loves lamb, it's and so I can't. Delicious. I'm out. I can't. So that do means you probably like a light, faint smoke on your stuff. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. mind a little smoke, but I also I like don't lot. really particularly care for mule deer. No. Yeah. So it, no. Yeah. It depends I, on what they're eating. If you catch one around a farm somewhere, it's going to taste like a whitetail ish. Yeah. Ish. Ish. <laughs> um, so, what we did this year is our local butcher, they do pepperoni sticks. And mm-hmm. if you bring in meat, they'll do a pound for pound swap. So, you're okay. getting mystery meat. You don't know yeah. what it is. That's why I don't. Mm, yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> but it w- actually was very a, po- a very positive experience. It was Bighorn Meats, is who we exchanged with in. in um, Buffalo, Wyoming. So okay. we brought in our mule deer, which I didn't want to eat. 
and traded that pound for pound for this mystery meat sticks. And I don't know what it is. It's mule deer, antelope, elk, yeah. whatever people bring in and drop off for a meat swap. And, oh, my gosh, my husband That's and I. That's kind of a cool idea. We <laughs> live on it. Well, then you don't have to wait for your meat sticks mm-hmm. to get done two months later. Well, you get them back, you I know. I do mine myself. I'm a loser. I'm a loser, okay? This is why I'm not filled to grill Christie no, style, I'm okay? Just saying, I'm just like wary of like, hmm, what are you doing back there? Did you take like a cut of my tenderloin? I'm not yeah. even giving that to you. <laughs> You're like, I do everything. I skin my own catfish. Well, we, we didn't have that opportunity to do that. Yeah. And even if there was like a butcher somewhere, yeah. we wouldn't be able to afford to have it yeah. done. Yeah. So. It's, it is is it is a lot of expense or it can be a very high expense. Um I, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, one of my fondest memories is my parents sitting around and they had chunks of old, like, my dad worked at a sawmill, so they had Mm -hmm. these chunks of Cortron, um, which is like a particle board with like a sheeny top on it. Okay. Great cutting board stuff, right? And my dad would line that with a table and they'd have two pans of water. My mom would have a pan of water, my dad a pan of water, and they would put the meat out and they'd make sure there was no hair on it and wipe it off and... You know, clean the meat and, you know, cut into the into steaks. And, mm. you know, my family still does that um, to this day. I just don't do it well, as often time. as I should. You don't With have as many animals as we harvest. But yeah. Yogi and I are still, we do it in our backyard now. Like there we're, you go. That's we are full ghetto. If you were to see our house... You would be like, these people are, are just country enough, but too, <laughs> too country for town. I mean, we got the tractor in the backyard. We've got the snowmobile, the side-by-side. And then my dad made me these archery hooks. And all fall, we were so flipping redneck. We had quarters of, <laughs> of deer and elk hanging off these hooks in our backyard. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Yogi and I are out there with a meat station cutting meat. And, <laughs> I mean, it was the, the neighbors are probably like, what is going on over there? Like, these people are psycho. Like <laughs> I was tanning. And two elk hides <laughs> in my front yard, and an HOA guy came by. He came by, and he's I was like, like, "You gotta stop." I was like, "Well, this is where the most sun is. Is here. Then I'll move him to the back later." And he was like, you, "You can't, you can't do that." And I was like, "Well, I'm surprised you know I'm tanning elk hides." He was like, "Oh yeah, I grew up hunting. I haven't had any meat in a while." So I was like, "I'll give you meat if I you gave, look I gave, away." I look gave away. him a pack, and he goes. <laughs> I won't be back for four days. <laughs> <laughs> Pick it up. You've been reprimanded by Neighborhood Watch. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. No, that's good. You live in a, a good neighborhood that's somewhat supportive of your life. So what about your friend group? Your friends are all hunters? and I No, I have friends from all different walks of life. I have anti-gun people, anti-hunter friends. Yeah. But they're always curious. Yeah. And then over the course of... Um, the pandemic yeah two week time frame stuff and then the uh, protests mm-hmm. messages yeah phone calls how do i do this how do i do that mm-hmm. and then it was like over and over the same kind of deal it was like going back to the 2a stuff and then, especially in california and uh, i was like well you can't just go and buy one i'm like there's a 10-day waiting period for california yeah and now it's even longer than that because everybody's trying to do what you're doing mm. and you've never even shot a gun before so you shouldn't own one because you need to train and be responsible like yeah yeah i don't care about that so like how do you do it and then i told him and everybody got mad and they're like what about the loophole i was like that's not a thing no there's no like, you can't just go and do it and they're no like, then they're, they're asking me can you just let me borrow one until all of this blows over and i was like no a hundred percent not mm-hmm. that'll come back on me mm-hmm. i was like no so some people did switch over from that yeah and uh, they come out here and they they train now because. So how do you have those conversations with them? Like I'm direct. Yeah. Hey, I'm I'm just direct. I'm like you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, even in Washington State, I had people call in, and I know that they smoke weed heavily. Yeah. And uh, well, Oregon does everything. <laughs> and I so. said, and I said, I'm like technically that is a against the law. That's exactly right. And I'm trying to explain it's that federally. To them. Yeah. Yeah. And you try to explain that, but it's legal. I'm like, it is legal, but it's not, not legal. Not legal. And then you said, like, it even asks you oh, on the form. And you're like, well, I don't. Why? I'm like, you got to give up one or the other. You can't yeah. have both. No. And I said, you can, but then it's against yeah. the law. Yeah. 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 So people didn't understand that. It's a lot of education because yeah. the propaganda that gets put out is you can just go to the store and buy one. I can because, you know, I've done all of the work. I yeah. have my CCW and all they, they still check. You still got to fill mm. out paperwork. They just want to make sure you haven't gone to jail or for something in the last yeah. 10 days or whatever it is. Yeah. But the normal person, you can't just walk in the store and pick one up and leave. Yeah. 
Hey everyone, after successfully using Rack One Big Game Peanut Butter and their super yummy PB&J in my spring bear baits, I'm really excited to share with you guys two new premium bear attractants from Rack One. One is Picnic Basket and the other one is Jelly Donut Flavors. Like every good picnic basket, this tantalizing blend contains a variety of irresistible snacks and treats to whet the appetite of any and all bears that come within range of its powerful, alluring aroma. The carefully blended mix of fruits and nuts and other secret ingredients put out a picnic spread and long distance scent trail that'll have the big fellows inviting themselves over to a party. I think it's safe to say that we all love donuts and that bears will also love to wake up to a yummy donut. Rack One's Jelly Donut is an aromatic mix of fruits and nuts blended with Rack One's secret ingredients formulated to lure bears in where you want them. The aroma is intense and nose catching even at long distance and will send the snack signal far downwind. All the Rack One flavors are sure to lure them in and can be placed wisely near trail cameras or your hunting stand. The rest is easy. All you have to do is make the shot. No, yeah, no, we, everybody yeah. does a background check and it's, it's a, that is a 100% accurate. Yeah. Um, there isn't a loophole, thank God. Um, so that, you know, we do try to do our best to keep firearms in the hands of safe, responsible yes. citizens. I mean, that's, 100%. that's something that we all stand behind and by. Yeah. Um, nobody wants firearms in the hands of criminals. But um, so when they, when they ask about your hunting, I mean, are you finding yourself having to explain, you know, this is how it's raised or, mm -hmm. or do they kind of get it? Uh, after the conversation, they get it, mm -hmm. and then they they become intrigued, mm -hmm. and then they want to go. Yeah, uh, it's I've taken it's a I've taken bridge. four vegans out that are not vegan anymore. That is and awesome. And the only reason that they were vegan were because of the industry, the meat industry. Mm. It wasn't because of restrictions or anything like that. And then once you explain you can kill two animals in a year, and mm -hmm. then that's all you're eating, you yeah. and your kid or whatever. Yeah. Then they want to go. I'm taking another one out uh, this next coming up season. Mm -hmm. It was a vegan. Yeah, it was a vegan. Former vegan. Yeah. I would starve to death. No, I don't. I don't see how the, how they do I it. Do it. Yeah. No, that, I have a hard time describing a meal as a meal if it doesn't contain meat. I'm like, that was a snack. <laughs> there was no meat. Therefore, it's not a meal. Yeah, we it's went a to a, we went to Alaska on a 12 day shoot. One of the ladies was uh, a vegan. And I had the conversation before we went. I said, we're going to Alaska. There's not a lot of vegetables up there. No. I said, everybody pretty much eats meat all the time. And we stayed at a guide's house that lived in the woods. Oh, boy. And she goes, I can find something everywhere I go. Mm. Coming, coming out of Los Angeles, California. Mm. And we get there and within three days. There's no Whole Foods. No. She was breaking down because she couldn't eat anything. And then, like, the guy was like, okay, I'll make you rice. But then he was using, like, the broth and everything with the oh, rice. No. <laughs> <laughs> so she found like a jar of peanut butter somewhere and she like lived on that. Peanut butter. Yeah. She lived I, mean, on I peanut could probably butter. live on peanut butter for a while. Yeah. That's for sure. It's really good. No, it is. It's interesting. I met a woman last weekend actually that was a vegan and she was an uh, animal rights activist. Uh -huh. And um, she was recently divorced and she had met a man who was also recently divorced. And, you know, they're later in life and, mm -hmm. and he was a hunter. And, um, mm. you know, she was trying to understand the process of hunting and she just didn't like commercial meat processing and, yeah. and you know and I get that, that just too. wasn't that just wasn't her thing and so um, he convinced her to begin eating wild wildlife mm -hmm. consuming wildlife and he had harvested an antelope and, and she mm. tried an antelope and she's like oh my gosh yeah. this is absolutely delicious yeah. so now after spending the last you know six or eight months consuming wildlife um, she's at a point where she's ready to go hunting. She's like, I won't See. eat meat, commercially raised meat, but I'm good with eating wild harvested meat. Mm -hmm. And so that's really been very transformative. And, and um, I'm trying to encourage her to apply for a scholarship to go on her first hunt with a group oh. of, you know, supportive community um, of other ladies and stuff. So hopefully she gets to do that. But nice. there's a lot of people that have that story that, that they love animals and they don't understand the, how you can kill them. And how yeah. you can eat them. And, you know, you try to explain the North American model of wildlife conservation. And you try to, uh, you try to explain um, 
harvest objectives yeah. and um, selective harvest mm -hmm. of age based on age and, and carrying capacities. And, and at the end of it, I think a lot of people really come away with a fundamental different understanding um, than what they went into it. Because, yeah. you know, the, the media really likes to play us as the villain. Oh, 100%. They think you're just out there pew, 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 shooting everything that runs and around. And we're all and drunk. Yeah, oh, doing 100%. It, 100% drunk and the all thing the time is, doing it. It's like really yeah. like nobody – firearms and alcohol – do not mix. Yeah. The hunters are not out there drinking and hunting and shooting. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just not that's just not what's happening. And the ones that are, most likely, they don't even have their license or any. They're mm -hmm. poaching as it is, and that's Who knows? not yeah. that's not the that's well, community at yeah. all. It's illegal already. Yeah. Like you're not supposed to be mixing firearms and alcohol. So, um, yeah, we 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 take a lot of pride in being an ethical community. And so, yeah, I think the media just loves to paint us as like this horrible bubba. Yeah. And you're from the south. You oh, yeah. should take offense to that. <laughs> I will. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> southern boy. Because <laughs> you know they, oh, they always painted as this southern boy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like southern bubba's drinking and shooting and like, no, it's not what it's like. We, we last night. So uh, Leon, he's a Marine friend of mine. This was his first shot show. Yeah. Took him hunting, uh, duck hunting this year, yeah. like two days ago. Uh, we went to a show last night. He got pulled up on stage. And they were like, hey, tell me about your day. Like, how did it happen? So yeah. he went everywhere from waking up at 2 o'clock yeah. all the way through the duck hunt and blah, blah, blah. And so then they did, like, a recreation. And he talked about me. And he immediately went to, like, this country bumpkin oh, accent thing. <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? It was funny, though. Yeah. And then he goes. Well, the stereotypes are funny. Yeah. Well, he went to, like, oh, and so you're here for SHOT Show. How were those people? Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get something. And I was like. It's like the most amazing group of people. Yeah. Everybody's open. Everybody's. And it was beautiful because they were already trying to bait and they were all from New York. Mm. So they only had one perspective yeah. of what we do. Yeah. And then just through conversation, we stayed up for another two hours. People that were in the audience were coming up and talking to That's us. That's incredible. Everything. Yeah. And it's, it's education and it's exposure. Mm -hmm. And if we just have a little bit more than that, uh, we can. Man, we can so get along in a whole different aspects of all kind of walks of life. Oh, 100%. Yeah, we don't have to agree about everything either. That's what makes life, no. like, delicious. No. That's we, how you We grow. just have to respect each other. Yeah. Right? And respect and each other's decisions. And learn from each other. 100%. Yeah, like, oh, why did you do that? I've never thought about it that mm -hmm. way. You mind if I try it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't like it. Yeah, so, not yeah, for me. It's to, like me when I tried lamb. I was like, hmm, yeah. it's not for me. The, okay. all, the only thing I don't, I cannot accept is if somebody orders a steak. And they put ketchup on it. No. Oh. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> Anything with the word well in it. Oh. So yeah, I'm like, why? Why even no. eat it? Just eat a bologna sandwich. Yeah. Like, I love bologna sandwiches, though. Uh, it's actually disgusting bologna. how much I like No, I smoke, I smoke the logs, and then I slice them, throw them in the freezer, and when I pull them out, I just fry them real quick. Oh, yeah. So you get all that smoke. Yeah. Ooh. My husband <laughs> eats horse meat. Like in Europe, it's yeah. a thing. Yes. Like when you go to the grocery store and you're shopping yes. for lunch meat, horse there's meat. a whole horse meat you section. You are not lying. And even like choice cuts in the stores, some of them have horse meat, like uh -huh. steaks. It's crazy. It's, uh, I, I mean, it's great. I think that people yeah. should eat horses. So, so we have a we we were having and still have a large uh, wild horse, or they call them feral horse problem out here. Yeah, they are feral horses. And yes. I said. I have a solution. Yes, and let's it eat was them. about hunting them and eating them because we have feral cows here, so yeah. you can kill them, right? I got so much hate from that. Oh my that. gosh, yeah, I it's was a like, very touchy subject. I'm like, because we've already given we've we've already given away all of the ones that were going to be given away. Mm. You no, know, there's no more people that want a free horse. Texas have come and take all the ones that they're going to take. Utah came and took all the ones that they're going to take, and now we're at the point where we still have all of these other ones. Mm -hmm. We can't even give them away. And I said, let's eat them. Mm -hmm. I'll take one right now. Yeah. I'll it's a thing over there. Like people have no issue with eating horse. Yeah. It's very consumptive, and um, and it's a well-established food practice oh, yeah. um, in almost every European country, if exactly. not all of them. Yeah. So it's really, I think, the U.S. is the only one who has demonized the consumption of horses. I have horses. Mm -hmm. I don't want to eat them particularly, but they're my pets. <laughs> um, when we were in Germany, we were at the market and they had um, donkey sausages. Oh, yeah. And I did some videos and they're like, do you want to try the donkey sausage? And I'm like, you know, I'm torn between being a meat eater and a donkey owner right now. <laughs> so I'm just going to pass. I have oh. no issue with it, but I didn't do it. I just didn't do it. I was like, ah. 
I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I don't need to eat the donkey. I'm fine. I didn't do it. But, you know, I, I don't have any problem with people that want to eat it. He, Yogi eats it all the time. He likes that really salty horse meat. Um, They're going to come home one day, and it's going to be hung, hanging up in the backyard. Oh, God. I think, you, <laughs> I think you would go to jail. I think I'm pretty sure if you killed your pet horse and ate it that somebody would turn you in. I don't think it's against the law. I don't know. I don't know. even think it's against the law to kill the feral horses here because there's nothing on the books. You oh, just, don't, I, don't, you just not re- even, I don't know about no, that. I think it's I, very, I think think it's it's very it's against the law. I don't, I don't think, think it so. is. No. Do not shoot horses. Don't, no, I'm not don't saying do to go do it at all. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so but, we're laughing, but it's not, <laughs> don't do it. But it's uh, like uh, in Lake Tahoe, yeah. uh, bear hunting yeah. is legal. Yeah. But then all of the people come at the checkpoint station yeah. and they're yelling at you and they're doing all of this stuff and it makes it. That's hunter harassment. It, like, it, man, that shouldn't yeah. be happening. Well, it's happening at the, it's not harassment because it's at the checkpoint. Mm, so It's crazy. People don't yeah. understand it. And, you know, it's people like you and me and everybody in this room that um, that we're trying to change the optic of that. And so yeah. what, what we're doing is so important, I think, and, um, and, and it. And it's necessary, mm-hmm. especially for the future generation. So um, I want to thank you for sitting down with me. I could literally spend the next hour and a half, keep talking to you. Um, <laughs> but it's SHOT Show, and we got stuff to do. Oh, I know. It's the last day, too. And they I know. It's winding oh, down. Oh, wow. We have an hour and ten minutes left before it's over. Is it? That's it? Yes. Holy smokes. Okay. We have an hour and ten minutes. Oh. Jeez, my <laughs> yeah, husband's back yeah, there. Like, uh, yeah, he's like, shut up, Christy. <laughs> shut up, Christy. Shut up. <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us. Um, where can people find you online? Let's go Instagram. Uh, you can just Google my name, Rydell Danzi, uh, anything Phil to Grill, F2G, and uh, you'll find any and everything, including my mainstream stuff. Yeah, you guys check them out. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast from the Ruger booth at the NSSF SHOT Show. And we will see you all next time. Thanks. Aww. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.